All right, hello, Logic Class. We're making a video. Let's see if this works. Boom, boom. One second. Is it working? No, it's not working. Um, let me try one more time. It's so weird. Um, so weird. There we go. Now it is working. Okay, great. Um, so sorry about that. Um, right. Ooh, it even looks like beautiful and stuff. Mm, okay, I got my iPad. Um, I got my Apple uh, pencils. Very exciting. Um, and today we're going to learn a last kind of big thing. Okay. In a perfect world, we would do this in 90 minutes. In theory, this could also be done in 45 minutes. Target time is going to be one hour. I think that we can do this in one hour. Exactly. This is very exciting. Uh, this is called Zermelo Frankel set theory. Okay. So what's going on in this class? Um, well, um, this is a little bit repetitive, but you know, repetition is good. What has been happening over the last uh, 50 years of mathematics answer everything has been reduced to set theory. Set theory has become the indispensable sort of uh, background theory of mathematics. And um, we have, in previous presentations, we've seen how um, uh, basically every single mathematical object can be represented as a set. There are some mathematical objects that you probably already thought were sets. So uh, like, uh, you know, functions are just... Um, sets of ordered pairs. And uh, we've seen in previous uh, classes that ordered pairs can also be sets. And um, well, the something that you probably didn't think about before this class is that, you know, uh, real numbers can be represented as sets of rationals. Rationals can be represented as um, sets of ordered pairs of, uh, of integers, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, even numbers can be represented as sets. Um, basically, by uh, the turn of the 20th century, by 1900, mathematics just is set theory. And by that, I mean um, every single uh, mathematical object that you could possibly want to do mathematics on can be represented as a set. And so set theory is seen to be this uh, mathematical theory which underlies all other mathematical theories. If you can get set theory working perfectly, then all of the other uh, branches of mathematics just become applications of set theory, or rather they can be expressed in terms of set theory. So this is kind of like the most important thing. And there was this kind of hierarchy of reduction that we saw in which, uh, you know, the lines and, and, and uh, stuff in non-Euclidean geometry could be represented as as um, uh, as kind of curves in Euclidean geometry, but even uh, says Hilbert, Euclidean geometry can be reduced in some sense to arithmetic by representing points uh, as ordered pairs of real numbers and representing lines as kind of algebraic equations. So everything just becomes kind of like numbers. And uh, we've seen how with Dedekind cuts and other kinds of constructions of uh, more advanced numbers that really the natural numbers are the only numbers you need at the bottom. And then we saw uh, it last week that uh, even the natural numbers can be constructed out of sets. They can be built out of sets. This is the von Neumann and that's probably the wrong uh, spelling of his name. And who knows? Uh, this is a von Neumann construction of the of the um, natural numbers that they can be sort of built out of sets. And uh, then something really bad happens. And it turns out that this extremely important, powerful, and influential um, theory of mathematics, set theory, which is seen to be the theory that's linking uh, all other theories and holding everything together, um, has in fact, collapsed into ruin and uh, set theory is inconsistent and all of mathematics has come crashed uh, uh, has come crashing to the ground. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, here are the options. How can we fix set theory? Okay, answer number one, which we saw uh, a, a week or two ago was uh, type theory. Okay, um, this was associated initially with Bertrand Russell. He was the proponent of type theory. And I don't want to say that type theory failed because it didn't exactly fail. It was a great idea. Um, it was very influential. There was not just one kind of type theory, but there were many, many sort of complicated, advanced uh, kinds of type theory. And there were various kind of quirks associated with them and um, uh, uh, kind of tricks and modifications. But 
Um, the thing is that, you know, when does, when does Russell's paradox happen? It happens in 1903. And uh, mathematicians don't really want to wait around for a long time um, to get this problem solved. And so they kind of like waited for Bertrand Russell because he seemed to be onto something. And eventually he publishes Principia Mathematica in about 1912. At least I think volume one comes out in 1912. And people just don't like it very much. It's very, very, very complicated and annoying. So when we say it didn't really work, what we mean by that is it didn't provide normal mathematicians with a simple solution to the um uh, contradictions of set theory that they could just kind of take and use immediately in their work. And that's because uh, Bertrand Russell was doing something kind of more ambitious. He was also a logicist and his type theory that he developed had a lot of kind of philosophical baggage associated with it. And that is, he was attempting uh, this reduction of mathematics to logic and not everyone agreed with that. And therefore not everyone agreed with sort of the individual choices that he made. Uh, they were very, um, uh, there was a lot of uh, a kind of uh, his own personal sort of opinions that were kind of uh, built into this giant project to build up arithmetic from uh, from logic alone. And that was generally considered to have not have not worked. OK, so like one down. Um, what was the other kind of uh, approach to Russell's paradox that we saw briefly? Well, when we talked about uh, Poincaré in class and then you were supposed to watch a, a movie about the intuitionists um, and um, you can think of the intuitionist as maybe a branch of an even broader group of mathematics called the constructivists. They've just admitted that mathematics is contradictory. And their uh, plan to avoid paradox is to just have less math. So they are willing to sacrifice everything. And what they're going to do is slowly and painfully over a period of 10, 20, 30 years, they're going to build mathematics back up again in this very careful constructionist way in which they only allow certain mathematical objects which have been uh, precisely and carefully constructed. Um, people don't like this either. And that's because people really like classical mathematics. And classical mathematics is the mathematics where you're just free to just do things that you want to do, uh, like use the law of the excluded middle and uh, just do sort of like normal math. People like ordinals. They're very important and very powerful. And so what people want is they want set theory fixed, but they don't want to give up, um, you know, major branches of mathematics, which is what the constructivists are sort of willing to do. Uh, maybe just maybe just calculus is contradictory and we just have to abandon it and replace it with something sort of more careful and kind of like less powerful. All right, what can we do instead? How about we just fix set theory? Um, and uh, look, what's the big deal? Some sets are bad, but most of them are fine. So what sets do we need to get rid of? Set of all sets, you go away. The Russell set, you go away. But other sets are just fine. So can we just have the good sets and not have the bad sets? Um, let's see if we can do that. So how are we going to uh, do this? Well, the problem mm, with set theory, it turns out, is that it was not axiomatized yet. Naive set theory had just two axioms. Uh, that you could make a set given any property and that um, uh, sets are uniquely determined by their members. Okay, so uh, what we had was effectively a sort of informal axiomless branch of mathematics that everyone was just dealing with by going on fields. And let's just fix this branch of mathematics the same way we have fixed every other possible branch of mathematics throughout history, which is provide the precise axioms that explain how uh, and what you are allowed to do uh, with sets exactly. Okay, and uh, the first person to attempt this is this guy who we have already seen, Ernst Zermelo. So uh, this is an amazing picture of him. Uh, you wish you could look uh, like Ernst Zermelo. Um, he was born in Germany. He did everything. He um, was uh, active at right at the end of the 19th century. Uh, he was uh, another person in, in Göttingen. This was the basically number one uh, university for math in, in Germany for a long period of time. He attended this uh, International Congress of, uh, of Mathematicians in 1900, more on this later. And he, inspired by Hilbert, um, he decided to uh, look more carefully into set theory. And in light of the paradoxes, he said, you know what? No big deal. I got this under control. I'm going to create axioms for set theory. And he just did it. In 1908, he publishes them. Okay, so you should think of this 
uh, what we're about to do right now as the mainstream response. The mainstream response to uh, the paradoxes of set theory are not to do what Russell did and to lock himself in a house and go crazy and try to um, spend 300 pages proving that one plus one equals two. That's kind of tedious and annoying. Also, we shouldn't just like abandon mathematics. That's what the constructivists wanted to do. Instead, um, let's have a sort of uh, minimal, let's, let's have an approach that requires minimal philosophical um, uh, a kind of uh, positions that you that you need to adopt. And let's just like, let's just fix it. Let's just fix it. Okay, um, there are two names that come up, Ernst Zermelo and this other guy, Abraham Frankel. And uh, okay, Zermelo, of course, does it first, but um, Frankel, uh, okay, he's also German. Uh, initially, he's born in Germany. Uh, he became a professor in the 20s. Um, he then uh, left. He taught in the University of Kiel in northern uh, northern Germany. And eventually he, uh, in the, in the uh, I think in the 20s, he, he moves to Israel. At the time, uh, at the time that was Palestine, British, British Palestine. And uh, he spent the rest of his life in, uh, in Palestine. Um, I don't know how long he lived. I think quite a while. So I, I think he would consider himself Israeli. He was Jewish, uh, but he was uh, initially German. Anyway, um, he improved Zermelo's axioms and he improved Zermelo's axioms to such a considerable degree that he got his own name kind of stuck in there. Um, so he uh, he radically sort of rewrote Zermelo's original axioms and he added a couple more. All right, and so this um, new axiomatization for mathematics, you can think of it as coming in stages. First, 1908, the Zermelo version, then 1922, the Frankel version. And so we name it after the two people. Zermelo, ZFC stands for Zermelo Frankel with choice. Uh, Z for Zermelo, F for Frankel, and C for choice, because we are going to include the axiom of choice in it. Okay, and uh, all right, this is kind of, a, um, you know, uh, I don't know, the, the person who wrote this presentation, uh, you know, threw this in. This is the first useful thing we've done in a while. Okay, okay, okay. Isn't, many of the things we've done were useful, but ZFC is useful in the sense that I'm now just teaching you. This is not some kind of weird uh, quirk, uh, a historical quirk that, that nobody knows about. This is a very basic mainstream part of modern mathematics that is still absolutely relevant in uh, in 2024. If you go to college and you, you get a math degree, you will certainly uh, take a course where you look more carefully into ZFC again. So I'm going to teach you something which start, happened in 1908, but is still completely relevant today. Okay, what are we going to do? No biggie. We're just going to axiomatize step theory. And as you've seen, um, every single mathematical object can be represented as a set. And so if every single mathematical can, object can be represented as a set, then at the base level, all things are sets. Everything is a set. So if every single thing is a set, then what we are about to create is a world in which the only objects in this world are sets. In other words, the domain of discourse in our system that we're presenting is sets. Everything is a set. And OK, uh, great. Um, and there's really only one mm, property. If you're comparing one set to another, the only property that those two sets can have is that one can be a mem one set can be a member of that other set or not. So there is sort of a single relation that exists between sets, and that is the relationship of membership. But the very concept of what it means for a one set to be a member of another set is the kind of thing that was taken to be so incredibly obvious and intuitive that it required no explanation. Well, you know, if A, uh, if A is in B, well, that just means that, you know, B is a big bunch of stuff and one of the things inside B is A. What, what more could you possibly want? Okay, but uh, now we are not doing that anymore. Now we are pursuing an axiomatization. When you pursue an axiomatization, you... Uh, can't take anything as intuitive anymore. And so the very concept of set membership is going to be um, axiomatized and defined implicitly. Okay, so if you're following this, let's just jump right in. Um, here are the axioms that were out there in 1908 and they're still, uh, still true today. Axiom one, the axiom of extensionality. And I think it's best to understand this at multiple different levels. So um, the first uh, level uh, to look at is just the basic um, simple, you know, using simple English. A set is uniquely determined by its elements. In other words, once you tell me all the elements that are in a set, that is the set. That's all there is to say. OK, that's how people talk often. But perhaps a little bit more uh, specifically, um, 
uh, this is the way Zermelo would have put it in German, not in English, but basically if two sets have the exact same elements, then they just are the same set. Okay, um, that sounds great. In fact, this was one of the axioms of naive set theory. So we've already we've already seen this axiom. Um, another thing you might do if you were feeling like it is try to understand this set, try to understand this axiom in uh, predicate logic. And one of the things that Frankel does that's so dramatic is that in, in 1908, when um, when Zermelo publishes his axioms, we are still, we're at the very, very tail end of the era in which you could still uh, just do your mathematics using simple, basic, natural language, like, you know, English or German or whatever. But by 1922, um, the... the, um, the uh, revolution in logic and in rigor and precision has had already been complete. And by now, it was understood that uh, every statement must be presented in some kind of uh, precise formal language. And that is the language of, of, of first order logic, of predicate logic. And so one of the things that Frankel does, in addition to proving, uh, improving some of Zermelo's uh, stuff, he sort of updates the axioms uh, for, this in, for this new era. And so the way you'll see the axioms presented today is as axioms written in predicate logic. Okay, so let's try to understand for each one of these axioms the, the predicate logic version. Um, what does it say? It says, for all Y and for all Z, <laughs> for all Y and for all Z, for all x, if x is in y, if and only if x is in z, then y is in z. Okay, so this is a bit of a mouthful, and there's a certain amount of uh, logic reading comprehension that's required to fully understand this. But once you kind of talk it out to yourself, I feel like it's not so bad. What is this really saying? It's saying, okay, take two sets, y and z. Okay, got it. Now, suppose that for all possible things, sets, x is in y, if and only if x is in z. In other words, whenever some element X is in Y, that element is also in Z, and vice versa. Whenever some element X is in Z, it's also in Y. Okay, well, therefore, this entire thing can be seen as just a fancy way of saying they have all the, they have all the same elements. Anything that's, in, uh, anything that's in Y is also in Z, and anything that's in Z is also in Y. If that's true, then, uh, then Y equals Z. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward um, uh, formalization of this concept. Okay, cool. The empty set. We simply come right out and tell you because you can no longer assume it to be true because we're assuming no common sense facts about sets anymore. So I just have to actually stipulate that there really is a set, uh, the empty set. It's the empty set, which has no elements, exists, and we write it with this symbol. Okay, um, what is the empty set? It's a set with no elements. And so the uh, predicate logic version says, yo, there really just is this set X. And what's true about the set X? Well, for all other sets Y, Y is just not in X. So nothing's in X. Okay, so far so good. Unordered pairs. All right, this is now a new thing that you have never uh, never seen before. The axiom of unordered pairs. Okay, um, let's look at the uh, natural language version first. For any two sets, X and Y, there exists another set, Z, um, whose members are only those two sets. This set is called the unordered pair of X and Y and is written X and Y. Okay, so this says that anytime you have some set X and anytime you have some set Y, you are permitted, this axiom stipulates, to make a new set um, with precisely two elements, asterisk, um, more on that in a minute, and those two elements are X and Y. Okay, seems fine. Um, in other words, you can just take two sets and smush, not smush them together. You can pair them. You make a little happy couple. Uh, you have a set X, you have a set Y, now you got a new set, uh, with, with, with X and Y in it and nothing else in it. Okay. Uh, looks, seems good. And, um, yeah, what's, let's look at the, um, uh, the, the predicate logic version of this, which is a bit of a mouthful. It says, okay, um, we have, uh, okay, what does it say? Whew. All right, for all X and for all Y. Okay, so in other words, give me any set X and give me any set Y. Then I claim that there is a new set Z where set Z is going to turn out to be the unordered pair of X and Y. And how should I characterize this set Z? Well, anything in set Z just is X or Y. In other words, for any W whatsoever, if W is in Z, then W is X or W is Y. 
and vice versa. If W is X or W is Y, then W is in D. Okay, so actually, if you take a minute and, and read that out to yourself, it makes complete sense. All right, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to talk about this, but exactly a year ago, uh, while on a plane ride, I was inspired to produce art um, illustrating the ZFC axioms. And um, here is, trying not to mess up the whole world here. Here is my axiom of pairing. Okay, I'm a terrible artist, so this is embarrassing that I'm sharing this with you. And I also got this from someone on on Twitter. Uh, it was uh, her idea as math professor um, to to uh, make these kinds of beautiful uh, pictures. So I'm stealing her uh, basic uh, kind of conceit, but I'm uh, expanding it. And so here, here's, this is supposed to be just a set floating around. This is another set floating around. And this is supposed to be, you know, Kronos, you know, that like, there's like that, like famous uh, painting of Kronos, like eating, uh, you know, Zeus or whatever. Um, and he swallows his babies. Well, that's kind of what this is supposed to be. So at any given time, you're allowed to be Kronos, swallow two of your children. And now there's a new set and that your two children are sort of inside of you. All right. I don't know if that uh, helped anyone or not. I got more of those uh, coming. Okay, good. More. Union. Oh, yeah, you're probably thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. I know about union. No, you don't know about union. This is a different kind of union. Um, what is union? Well, here's our first attempt to understand it. For any set X, um, so for example, imagine this is, the, this is our set X. Uh, this set X contains two sets. The first set is the set one, two, and the second set is the set AB. Then we can make a new set Y whose elements are all the elements of X's elements. <laughs> In other words, you may uh, put together in one big new set anything which is in any of the things which are in X. Okay, this is sometimes referred to as like big union. If you have a union of a whole bunch of sets, so, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, you have a whole bunch of sets together, then uh, we, we sort of did this uh, once when it came to Dedekind cuts, then what we are doing is we're unioning, maybe never, never, never mind this. What we're really doing is we're unioning a set and unioning that set gives us all the elements which are in any of the elements of X. Okay, uh, this is called, and this is called the union. So it's an operation that you apply to one set and it produces a new set. And what you can sort of think of this as doing is kind of like dissolving the walls, uh, so to speak. You're dissolving the walls and you get this new one. All right, and I've also explained this in terms of Halloween candy because sometimes when you go uh, trick-or-treating, you have like a big bag. This is your big uh, bag. These are, your, these are the handles of your bag. And then you go to every house and you say, you know, give me, give me, give me candy. And they give you candy. And so, you know, you put the things in there. All right. Now, if you're in some kind of, uh, you know, crazy land of the 50s where everything is, um, you know, uh, completely trustworthy, maybe someone just tosses in like an empty, you know, cookie or something like that, or like a homemade treat. But that would be crazy. Um, instead, we want to really give kids like, you know, packaged objects uh, that are sealed and all that kind of stuff. So basically, every single uh, thing you get when you go trick-or-treating is itself has kind of like a wrapper on it. And so what you might do if you were sort of insane is go home at the end of the night and unwrap every single piece of candy in your entire Halloween bag. Open up every Snickers bar, open up every Twix, open up every bag of M&Ms, open up every bag of Reese's Pieces and dump them all out. So you just had like raw direct uh, candy. That's what this axiom of union does. It converts your Halloween bag into a new bag in which now all the wrappers are gone. So you can think of this union axiom as removing all the wrappers. Now, every single thing in here might be candy. There still could be some wrapped things because you might have some crazy candy where there was like something wrapped inside another bag. So, okay. Um, that was kind of hard to explain. Let's keep going. Um, let's try to understand it in predicate logic, shall we? What does it say? It says, all right, give me some set X. Got it. Then I claim that, that there is some new set Y. All right, what's up with this new set Y? Well, everything in Y, so for any Z, if Z is in Y, everything in Y, Y is the new set that I'm claiming exists. Everything in Y is something. 
<laughs> uh, that was in some U that was also in X. Okay, this is very, I, I think this is kind of hard to understand. But in other words, if there is some kind of element U, which is in X, so one of the sets inside X, and Z is something which is inside U, then Z is something which is inside Y. This is consistent with what I said with removing the wrapper. Um, okay, uh, so Z Z was like a piece of, uh, uh, Z was like the Snickers bar, and U was like the wrapped Snickers bar, or or maybe uh, maybe like uh, Twix is better because there are two of them. You know, Z was like one of the two Twix bars. U was the wrapper containing both those Twix, Twix, uh, Twix bars, and X was your bag of Halloween candy. So for any giant big bag of Halloween candy, there's, okay, I think everyone gets it. All right, I also made a picture of this. Um, I don't know if you guys like my artwork. Um, the Axiom of Union. Here I was trying to evoke kind of like classic uh, cell mitosis uh, sort of uh, art or something like that. Anyway, you have some giant set and inside that set are a whole bunch of other sets. Now what we, can, what we do when we apply the Axiom of Union is like I said, we sort of dissolve the outer layer, so to speak, of every single thing inside that set. And now you see these little um, jagged edges are the out the, the cell wall kind of like dissolving or, or cell membrane or something, the outermost layer. And now what ends up uh, in the final, uh, the final set that is created by the axiom of union? Mm, all the things that were in, all the things that were in X. And then things kind of find each other that would happen to be actually the same thing and they kind of cancel each other out or something. Okay, back to the presentation. Oh my gosh, taking forever. Uh, one more, subset construction. Okay, this is also known as sep separation or comprehension. Mm, this says, and this is like a big deal. This says that for any property whatsoever, I can create, uh, I can apply that property, so to speak, to some previously existing set to create a subset. Okay, okay. So what, what is this axiom saying? This is basically the axiom that says I can make subsets. After all, um, we did this kind of thing all the time. And the thing that caused um, Frege's whole system to collapse is this unrestricted comprehension. He said, given any property whatsoever, I can make a set uh, of all the objects that um, exhibit that property. We uh, realize now that that leads to contradiction, but we still need to make subsets. Now you always have to apply your subset to some set that already exists. And so give me any property whatsoever. And oh, let's go here. Um, okay. Uh, this, this is probably the simplest, this is probably the simplest way of talking about it. This, this um, uh, bullet point C, uh, you have this set Y. What is set Y? You are just allowed whenever you want, assuming that you already have a set Z out there that you've already constructed via these axioms, then you can make a new set Y, which is all the things that are in Z that also satisfy property P. Okay. Uh, and let's try to understand the predicate logic version of it. It goes kind of like this. Yo, do you have a set Z? Yes. Well, I claim then there is a set Y. And what is this set Y? Well, for all X, X is in Y. In other words, what does it take to get into this set Y? Well, what it takes to get into this set Y is that you are in Z and that you also have property P. Okay, so I think this is pretty straightforward, right? Um, the, the elements of uh, this set Y that we are asserting exists are all the things that are in Z and furthermore have this property. Okay, so we're making a subset of Z. Y is a subset of Z. Uh, good. Um, all right, more. Okay, some now some pause for some sort of understanding. What do we have? We have, oh, and also this is some you know beautiful uh, presentation uh, design going on over here. Uh, Lydia, who who made this presentation, she sort of uh, has uh, summarized kind of in bullet point the five axioms that we have so far. Extensionality: two sets are equal if they have the same elements. There is an empty set. Anytime you want to, you can uh, put two sets together in to make a new set. You can you can pair them together into into this new set. Uh, Kronos uh, swallows his children. Uh, you can union a bunch of sets together where you open up all the wrappers and dump everything into the into the um, pillowcase. And here you can, if you already have a set Z, 
um, you can uh, construct the subset of Z uh, consisting of all the elements that also obey some kind of property. All right, what's axiom two? So now let's now some sort of commentary or something. All right, comment number one, uh, axiom two uh, tells us that we at least have a set at all. Uh, axiom two just comes right out and says the empty set exists. So that postulates that there's at least one set in our sort of universe. Okay. Uh, axioms three through five should be viewed as generating rules. They make new sets from already existing ones. So um, what does axiom uh, three do? Axiom three says, if you have two sets, you can put them together. So that's making more and more and more sets. Uh, what is axiom uh, four doing? It's unioning. So if you have a big set, you're allowed to apply this union operation, which creates a new set. And set uh, axiom five creates subsets of sets that you've already shown exist. And so mm, these are generating rules that allow you to sort of make more and more and more sets out of uh, sets that you already know exist. And there's only one set that we were given initially. OK, so axioms two through five together, if you think about it, from these axioms alone, you will only ever be able to generate finite sets because uh, you have the empty set. And then when you apply unordered pairing, you know, and you apply union, you apply subconstruction, you sort of use your imagination. Um, you're only allowed to apply these axioms kind of like a finite number of times. And so finite applications of axioms two through five will generate an infinite number of sets because you can, um, keep applying like the pairing axiom, like again and again and again and again. So you can make sets that are bigger and bigger and bigger. This provides us a sort of a world uh, with an infinite number of sets, but the sets themselves are all finite. Uh, more axioms are coming. Okay, but here's the big thing. The big thing, and I already sort of mentioned this on the previous slide, the big thing to sort of understand is that the entire point of this uh, axiomization of set theory is to remove the paradoxes. We want to get rid of Russell's paradox, or rather, instead of getting rid of Russell's paradox, what we are going to do is dance around it. The biggest, the, the, the big sort of picture, okay, okay. The big sort of picture here, what's going on is, we got good, I said this already at the beginning, but I'm just repeating myself. We have the good sets and the bad sets. The good sets are all the sets that caused us no trouble whatsoever. The normal sets, the well-behaved sets, the happy sets, the sets that are required to do mathematics. We want those sets and what we don't want are these impossibly gigantic, disgusting, huge sets, like the set of all sets and stuff like that, those we don't want. And so what this axiomatization is doing is it is um, building up set theory from scratch. And it is building it up from scratch in a way to sort of goals. There are sort of two goals of this entire axiomatization of set theory. Goal one, is for the system to be powerful enough to um, generate all of the sets that are required to do normal mathematics. Set theory is the, the sort of the language of mathematics. So we need all these sets. And um, so let's make our system powerful enough to, to generate those sets. But we also want to make it weak enough that it doesn't cause any contradictions. And so if you think about it, what did... Um, uh, what what did uh, the 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 contradiction come from? What what was Russell's paradox? Russell's paradox was um, the the set of what the the set of all sets that don't include themselves. This was this was kind of the Russell set. So the set of all x such that x is not an element of x. Okay, so somehow or another, we need to construct our axioms in such a way that this set can't happen, um, and. The way we do that is with this unrestricted comprehension um, because this is no longer allowed anymore. Um, you are no longer allowed to say the set of all X such that. You have to say um, the set of all X um, uh, uh, from some set that already exists. In other words, here, the property would be, the property under discussion here is the property of X not being a member of itself. You are allowed to apply that property, but you have to apply that property to a set that already exists. And you can't construct the set of all sets in this system. Okay, so I think this 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 hopefully uh, slide is making this all clear. In naive set theory, which was turned out to be paradoxical, you have the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. 
for any property whatsoever. You were simply allowed to make the set Y. And what does it take to be in Y? That you have property P. That's it. This, we just can't have this anymore. Um, because from this, we can uh, construct the Russell set and everything collapses. So, um, all right. What, uh, how does ZFC avoid this? ZFC avoids this by not having the axiom of unrestricted comprehension, but instead having the axiom of comprehension or restricted comprehension. Now it says they sound similar, but they're slightly different. Now mm, you can apply some property, but you apply it already to, uh, to this set Z. So first you make some set Z, and then you apply, okay, I think everyone's clear on this, right? You can only construct subsets of existing sets. <clears throat> okay, let's do it. You can't uh, understand ZFC without doing some ZFC. So everyone, get out a piece of paper. It's very sad to be doing this by video because this is usually one of the most fun lectures of the year. Uh, I split everyone up into groups and we just take like 20 minutes and we just make a bunch of sets. Okay, so let's go. Over the next uh, 10, this is going to take us like 10 minutes. We're probably even going to only just do these three. Um, let's prove that these sets exist. Okay. This is crazy. How are we going to do it? Well, it's helpful to sort of create like a world of sets. A world of sets is kind of like our universe of sets that we have already shown must exist by virtue of these axioms. And so, all right, our very first, the very first set in our world is the empty set. We indeed just have the empty set because we have an entire axiom that just says you have the empty set. Okay, congratulations, we have the empty set now. All right, what should we do next? Well, I need to make this set, the set containing the empty set. And here, uh, usually some people in the class figure this out, but uh, it takes a few minutes to understand how we're ever gonna do this. Uh, it doesn't seem like any of these axioms are going to be helpful. Aha! The axiom of pairing, I mentioned an asterisk 15 minutes ago. The axiom of pairing takes two sets, X and Y, and puts them together in a new uh, set. But there's actually nothing specific that requires that they be two distinct sets. They could, in fact, be the same set. Dun, 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 dun. In other words, set X and Y to be the empty set. Okay, so we're gonna go over here and the sort of step one or something like that is apply um, axiom three, that is the axiom of unordered pairs to uh, the empty set. And when you do that, what do you get? Well, you get a new set and that new set uh, has precisely two members. The two members are, okay, okay, actually, um, uh, that, that that's maybe a little bit uh, misleading. Apply axiom three to the empty set, sort of like and the empty set. Um, okay, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that that's what we're gonna do. Apply axiom three to the empty set and the empty set. And when you apply axiom three to the empty set and the empty set, well, you get a new set um, with exactly two members: the empty set and the empty set. All right. Oh boy, that is gonna be a disaster because I lost all of my writing. Okay, let me just make sure to not do that again. Um, so world of sets. Now I'm very sad for other reasons. Um, this is my world of sets. And I get the empty set. Okay, so like step one, I said, oh boy, not an iPad girl yet. Um, so apply, apply axiom three to the empty set and the empty set yielding uh, a new set which has you know two members uh, and those two members are the empty set and the empty set. Okay, but you're probably thinking, dude, Mr. Rose, isn't it just true that a set is uniquely determined by its members? Yes. And so by axiom one, this is how axiom one gets kind of applied, the set containing the empty set uh, and the empty set is in fact just the set containing the empty set because two sets are equal if they have the same members and these two sets have the same members. Most people will even just skip this line and will just go straight. But if you wanna get a super technical, this is kind of what's going on here. All right, so that means that there's a new set in our world. Hello, new set, the set containing the empty set. I love you. 
Uh, what can we do next? Oh, so if you're appreciating what just happened here, effectively, anytime you want to, this axiom of unordered pairs can be applied where X and Y are set to the same object. And when you apply the axiom of unordered pairs um, with two objects that are the same object, this effectively uh, wraps that uh, set in like a new layer of, of, uh, of brackets. So now we can see how this is going to happen again. So what do I do next? Um, so, okay, so sort of one down, right? This one's kind of down. All right, how do I do the next one? Um, the, the, the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. Okay, well, the union is going to have to be applied here. Um, but in order to apply the axiom of union, I first need everything to be wrapped. Okay, so uh, you might understand this or you might not. But what I'm first going to do is create the set containing the set containing the empty set. Okay, let, let's just go. So in other words, again, apply axiom three to uh, this set that we already have that exists, this one, uh, and itself. And when you apply axiom three to, uh, to that set and itself, what do you get? Well, you get a new set, which is the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. Okay, but it can be uh, seen by once again applying axiom one, I might skip this in the future, that the set containing the set containing the empty set, uh, wait, uh, shoot, I need to, <laughs> and this is just this. Okay, so um, details here are getting kind of complicated, but basically you can just repeat the same logic from steps one and two above uh, to this second set that we have in our, in our universe. And by applying first axiom three uh, and then axiom one, you effectively like wrap it again. Okay, and that creates this set. And you may or may not have appreciated that it was necessary to create this set. Why is it necessary to create this set? Because now we are going to apply the axiom of union. So apply uh, axiom four. And uh, have I done this correctly? No. Um, Uh, no, sorry, not axiom four. Apply axiom three. Yeah, axiom three. Because first, I need to group together. Oh man, this is crazy. So I have to get a new, uh, I have to get a new uh, Halloween uh, pillowcase. Uh, in the 80s, everyone just used pillowcases for their bags. I don't know why. Um, so people go trick or treating with a pillowcase. And so you grab a new pillowcase. And what are you going to do with that pillowcase? You're going to dump into it. Um, the two previous sets. So um, this this set this set number two in our world of sets, and the set number three in our world of sets. Okay, what does this uh, accomplish? This creates by the axiom of unordered pairs a new set with precisely two elements, and those those two elements are the set containing the empty set and the set containing the set containing like this, this, this right here. Okay, so now I got this new set uh, with exactly two elements in it. I will add that to my world of sets because why not? It deserves to be on the list. Um, boom, 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 uh, boom, boom, boom. Very easy to make a mistake here, but I don't think I have. And if you're seeing what's going on here, now that all of the candy that I wanted has been wrapped, I now I'm going to apply the axiom of union. So now apply axiom four um, to, to this set, to this big set. Uh, boom, 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 boom. 
And what does the axiom of union uh, do? Well, as you saw with my uh, goofy artwork, it dissolves all the cell walls and it dumps all the candy in. And what you end up with is a new set, which is the empty set and the set containing the empty set, which was exactly our target set. Okay. Um, do we want to keep going? Um, I have, most years I go all the way. Um, so I don't know, this happening to be a video, it's a little bit sad. Um, let me see how much more space I have on this board. Can we make even another one? Yeah, I can. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap again. So by, I'll just go, I'll, I'll skip some steps now. I'll say by axiom three applied to um, sort of, sort of like applied to um, object five. Am I doing this right? Um wait, 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 wait. Not axiom three. I want to apply on axi I want to apply axiom three to I guess I'm just gonna do it to um no, I need to wrap again. Uh ap applied to this guy, I just end up with a new set, and that new set is the set containing the set containing the empty set. Okay, so never mind how I can do this. I think you are all convinced that there, I can make this set by just performing another wrap. And why is this other wrap necessary? Because once I provide this other wrap, then if I'm doing this correctly, I am now going to apply unordered pairs um, uh, by axiom three applied to, I'll just say six, five, and six. In other words, um, the 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 sets five and six. Uh, if I apply the axiom of unordered pairs to it, then I get a new set with exactly two elements. And the uh, two elements in that set are the set containing the empty set and the set contain this guy. So that set. And the other one is this set. Okay, and now I have really run out of room but uh, if you then apply union to that, then you dump out all the Halloween candy and you get the empty set, dissolve the cell walls, the set containing the empty set, and the set containing this guy right here. All right. If I've made a math error here, it's really embarrassing. I promise this is kind of like fun and interesting. Uh, we did this one. We skipped another one. Uh, that's good enough. Uh, that's good enough. All right. I think um, we have spent enough time now getting into the sort of like nitty gritty of how one uses ZFC. And hopefully you're getting a little bit more comfortable with these kind of uh, basic introductory uh, axioms, like the axiom of unordered pairs and the axiom of union and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. Um, I'm not going to do all these now, but one can show, in fact, that uh, given any set X, you can always make the set containing X. We've sort of already seen that. You apply uh, the unordered pair axiom uh, to X and itself. And then uh, by axiom one, that's the same thing as axiom X. Um, you can also, anytime you want to, you can make a set out of with precisely three elements, X, Y, and Z. How do you do that? Well, you first wrap X. Uh, then you apply unordered pairs to uh, Y and Z. Then you take these together, and by applying unordered pairs to these, you get the set containing uh, X and the set containing Y and Z. And then by applying union uh, to that, uh, you get the set containing X, Y, and Z. Okay, so if you're following all this, that's very exciting. I think I've done this correctly. Uh, apply unordered, unordered pairs to X. Uh, the X and X gives you the set containing X. Or applying unordered pairs to X and X gives you the set with two members, X and X, which is just the set containing X. Applying unordered pairs to Y and Z, uh, assuming those sets already exist, give you the set containing Y and Z. Applying 
unordered pairs to those two sets gives you a new set whose two elements are that set and that set. And now applying union to that set uh, gives you all the elements that are in all the elements of this outer set. In other words, X, Y, and Z itself. Okay, so what this means is, what I'm basically showing you is that these axioms are powerful enough to do the sort of basic things that we do with sets, which is kind of like put them together into groups. Okay, and in fact, you may construct uh, the traditional, I call this traditional union. Traditional union is the union that you've been using since you know middle school or something. Traditional union is when you have two sets, X and Y, and you just union them together. Well, um, what you can, um, yeah, you can, it's just easy to show that traditional union is also um, a, 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 a sort of a reproducible using these axioms. Okay, let's keep going. These are, these are all the proofs. These are Lydia's proofs. So when I post this uh, PowerPoint presentation, if you want to click through those, I don't know if this is gonna be clearer than what I did. Uh, or less clear. I'm not sure. She has a lot of notation. But um, for example, here's her proof that you really can uh, union two sets. Um, take the, oh, construct first the set containing just X and Y, call that A, then apply union to that new set A, which gives you all the elements that are in X and all the elements that are in Y. Then, oh, then she just stopped. <laughs> but then I think, oh, that's it. You're done. That's why she stopped. Uh, that's just what union is. Good job. Okay, um, skipping now all the details, one may, therefore, within these new ZFC axioms, reproduce some of the sort of traditional set theory. That is, in traditional set theory, you could just union two sets together. Well, we've just showed that, in fact, that's easy to do, right? Apply unordered pairs to A and B, and then apply union to that new set, and you get all the things that are in A or B hey, how can we take the intersection of two sets? All right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new predicate called X is in B. And then we're going to apply axiom five, the subset construction axiom, to, uh, with this predicate, to set A. In other words, think of A intersect B as the set of all X that is already in A that also satisfies this property. Whereas this property is the property of being in B. Um, in other words, think of A intersect B as a, a subset of A. Specifically, it's the subset of A um, consisting of all the elements satisfying the property also in B. So there it is. Okay, you can also take the difference of two sets. Uh, this is getting pretty, uh, I think, obvious now. Now we just set our predicate B to be something different. Now we set our predicate B to be the predicate of X is not in B. And so what is A minus B? It's the subset of A satisfying that predicate. Um, hey, we can also define the subset relation um, out of the set membership relation. So there's really just one uh, possible uh, relation that sets have with each other. As I mentioned already, it's the inclusion relationship. So subset is not a primitive because you can define the subset relation. A is a subset of B, if and only if, uh, for all, A is a subset of B precisely when, uh, for all X, if X is in A, then X is in B. Okay, and so we've, we've sort of like done it now, or we've done basic set theory, the kind of set theory you learn in school, and all of these set theory theorems that were generally considered to be just common sense or something like that, uh, these are now theorems of ZFC. Okay, and we don't want to do this. All right, hey, do you remember, uh, we also need uh, ordered pairs to do mathematics. So like one day I mentioned for one second that ordered pairs could also be represented as sets. Okay, so now it's important that you understand this definition. The ordered pair X comma Y can be represented as the set containing the set containing X and the set containing X, Y. Uh, okay, in other words, we sort of distinguish the left element uh, of the ordered pair uh, is the one that shows up kind of like in both sets. And the right element of the ordered pair is the one that shows up in only one of the subsets. So, because these sets are unordered. Okay, and then you can define you can define ordered triples and blah blah blah. All right. So, I mentioned a long time ago that 
these axioms so far uh, uh, will only let you do, you know, certain kind of restricted things, you know, building new sets up kind of like one at a time. But it is also indispensable for mathematics that we are able to create hmm, the power set. And so we have an entire axiom. This is now axiom six of ZFC that anytime you want to, you can create the power set of some other axiom. Okay, so here, here is the, the natural language version for any set X, its power set uh, written like this is all the elements, uh, it's power whose, yeah, for instance, power set whose members are all exactly all subsets of X exists. Okay, that's kind of weird, uh, weird phrasing. Um, but uh, we know that the power set of some set X is traditionally people call it um, the set of all. Um, let me just use this uh, new new notation here. It's the set of all Z um, such that uh, Z is a subset of X. It's the set of all subsets of X. And uh, notice that we need to postulate the existence. Uh, th this, this axiom is required because this is the kind of thing that I'm sort of not allowed to do or, or something like that. I cannot define the power set axiom uh, because um, I don't have a kind of a, a larger set, so to speak, to which I may apply this property of being a subset of X2. So I have to sort of stipulate, I have to build it into my axioms that I'm allowed to create this, this giant power set because there is no way of creating this huge set. Uh, um, so it, it appears I'm using unrestricted comprehension here, but I'm not really using unrestricted comprehension because there's just an axiom that says I'm allowed to do this. Okay, let's try to understand this axiom in, in the in the in uh, predicate logic. Well, it says for all, for any x whatsoever. Okay, so you got yourself a set. Congratulations. We're about to construct the power set of that set, and we're going to call it y. What is y? It's y is um, the set and consisting of a bunch of subsets. So what does it take for some z to be in y? Well, you're in y, z is in y, if and only if z is a subset of x. So that's what it is. The elements of y are the subsets of x. So that's pretty clear. Okay, um, and now uh, if you're looking at this, uh, if you have some set, then, okay, great. You have, I have a set with two elements. The power set is just the set of all subsets. It's gonna have four elements. The empty set is always an element of the power set. And so is the set itself, always an element of the power set because every set's a subset of itself. And, you know, if you have a finite number of elements, then the power set is going to have two to the N of those elements. And, uh, yeah, they have two choices, two choices, et cetera. Okay, I also made some pretty artwork for this. Um, let's see. Uh, this, oh, by the way, this was my, uh, this was my axiom of separation. Um, so you had some predicate P, and you're, spo that you're supposed to think of this as like a wall with a P-shaped uh, cutout uh, on that wall. And here are a bunch of sets. And some of those sets satisfy property P and some of those sets don't. And the only ones you sort of have a pre-existing set uh, here full of a bunch of other sets. And when you apply the axiom of separation, uh, also known as the axiom of comprehension, also known, you know, uh, whatever, then you are uh, sort of um, uh, sifting through these sets and only letting the ones that satisfy property P through. So that's kind of pretty. And then um, I also made my um, power set axiom, I'm kind of proud of this one. You have some set, in this case, the set has three elements, and then you perform a thinking operation where you decide who to invite to your party. And first, do we invite this set to our party? Yes or no. Do we invite this set to our party? Yes or no. This set to our party? Yes or no. And this produces eight new subsets. So this is the power set axiom sort of in operation. Uh, okay. Uh, we're going to try to wrap up this presentation now by doing some skipping around. Because this gets really complicated. It's very technical, but it's, it's a little bit over the top. Um, but if you really want to understand uh, set theory, then you need to be able to construct the Cartesian product of two sets. That is very, very important thing to do. Because ultimately, if you are going to define a function from A to B, then what is that function going to be? Well, it's going to be a set of ordered pairs. And for example, um, if A is one, two, perhaps, you know, one 
goes to uh to y and uh two goes to x so um great uh so every function from one set to another set is a set of ordered pairs um all right well what so what is uh a times b a times b is like the entire relation. It's the entire uh, thing from which you construct the function. Okay, so it's like basically, it's every possible element uh, of A uh, matched with every possible element from B. So this is the this is the set that you need to construct. And then the function, a function from A to B is gonna turn out to be a subset of this set. Okay, so what's the big deal? Let's just make the Cartesian product. Oh boy. Well, recall that in our ZFC, um, an ordered pair is not a primitive. An ordered pair is, in fact, uh, a set itself. And so we have to like go multiple levels deep here. So the set that we really have to construct in ZFC is this one. And how do we do it? We first union A and B, and then you construct the power set of that. So now I have this new set, which in our case has 16 uh, elements. And what are all uh, these elements? They are subsets of A union B. And then, believe it or not, the next thing you need to do is construct the power set of that. Now you get a new set, which has 2 to the 16th, uh, which is 65,536 elements. Is this all really necessary, Mr. Rose? Yes. Because then what you are going to do to this ridiculously large uh, uh, power set is apply the uh, property, uh, the property that X is uh, an ordered pair AB where A is in, uh, in big A and B is in big B. And you get A times B. Okay, so in other words, this is the power set of A union B. The, in, then you, you make this set with size two to the 16th. And from that set with size two to the 16th, 99.99% of those um, subsets are garbage, but four of them turn out to be the precise uh, elements, which in fact are um, the, this, this is the construction of A times B. A times B is a specific set with four elements. And those four elements are these four purple things. And these are the four purple things uh, drawn from this larger set of size two to the 16th that happen to uh, fit the, 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 uh, the pattern um, that the, the left element is an element of A and the right element is an element of B. All right, so that was like a little bit show up. All right, what does our set theory look like? I mentioned already that we have uh, only uh, a finite number of sets that, no, it's not that we have a finite number of sets. We have an infinite number of sets, but we all the sets that we can make are finite. And that's true. Even when you apply the power set axiom to a set of finite size, you get a set with a two to the that size, but that set is still finite. So we have now a world uh, in which there are an infinite number of sets, but those sets themselves are all finite. Okay, so where are the infinite sets, you might be asking? Don't we have... <laughs> oh, no. Uh, don't we also need infinite sets for mathematics? Yes, we really do. Can you close the door? If you're going to play in there, close the door. Um, in order to do traditional mathematics, the mathematics of, uh, of Cantor and Hilbert and everybody else, then we really do embrace actual infinity. So we need infinite sets. Okay, so to do this, we are now going to build the ordinals. Let's go. Can you guys go downstairs? Uh, so we are going to make this new operation, the successor function. We have seen already that the successor function is a set theoretic operation in the von Neumann ordinals. Okay, and so um, now um, Lydia is kind of reviewing how this works. We define zero as the empty set. We define one as the successor of zero. And the definition of the successor is it's that element union the set containing that element. And so what we get is the empty set union the, union the set containing zero, so that's zero. What is two? Two is the successor of one. Well, the successor operation says, take that element, union the set containing that element. Well, that gives you one is by definition, the set containing zero. And when you union together, the set containing zero and the set containing one, you get the set containing zero and one. So two is the set containing zero and one. Three 
two union the set containing two. So that two is zero one. And so this is a pretty good explanation if you didn't get it last time of the von Neumann uh, ordinal construction in which every number is a set. And in fact, every number is the set of all the numbers less than it. Um, and yes, that's exactly what this is saying here, right? Every number <laughs> N is just ends up being the union of all the numbers less. Okay, but I also need, um, I also need, can you please, can you, can you please go away? I also need to construct omega. So the goal is to construct omega. We really need omega. We want our set theory to be powerful enough that it includes omega as one of our sets. But uh, omega is a set of infinite size, and we don't have any axioms that are powerful enough to construct a set of infinite size. So let's do it. We have the axiom of infinity. In chapter 10 of Loss of Certainty, um, you know, uh, people are very mean to Bertrand Russell. And one of the reasons why they're mean uh, to, uh, to him is because he adopts this axiom of infinity. And this axiom of infinity uh, is an axiom that just says there are sets of infinite size. And it turns out that you really need that to do, uh, to do mathematics. You cannot uh, sort of build an infinite size set uh, in a finite number of steps out of finite size sets. So you need to give yourself this power. Well, people were mad at Bertrand Russell because he was claiming that all of his axioms were just logical axioms, and then that's just not a logical axiom. But the ZFC people have no philosophical uh, baggage associated with them. They're just doing whatever they need to do. They just want to avoid the paradoxes. So they boldly embrace an axiom that just basically is going to allow us to construct sets of infinite size. And here's what it says. Okay, it's a little bit complicated. First, there's this kind of definition. The definition of what it means for a set to be inductive. Okay, well, what does it take? What does it take uh, for a set to be inductive? Well, it has to have zero in it. And whenever it has a number, it has that number's successor, where successor is defined as on the previous slide. And so um, if zero is in your set, uh, then so must the successor be, and so must the successor of that, and so must the successor of that, sort of like forever. So you're probably just thinking, oh, inductive just means you are the naturals. Not quite, because uh, other sets might also be inductive because they might have in them like some some monsters or whatever. Um, so, or, you know, like some triangles or just like, you know, some other who knows what uh, things, but also all the, um, the naturals. And so effectively, um, you can think of a, an inductive set as being a set which is the naturals at least, you know, the naturals, you know, plus more contains at least all the naturals. So by definition, this is just what inductive means. And uh, so it's it's a superset of omega. Okay, well, the axiom of infinity simply asserts that there exists an inductive set. Uh, I think that's what it says. Let's see, what does it say? Uh, in, in Over here in A, it says there exists a set A such that the empty set is in it, and whenever a number is in it, the successor is in it. So that's exactly it. So the axiom of infinity asserts the existence of an inductive set. And one may do some math and prove some very sort of complicated math. One may do some complicated math and prove that, in fact, of all the inductive sets, omega is the unique smallest inductive set. Or, if you prefer, omega is the set which is the subset of every inductive set. And there is a unique uh, set, which is the subset of every inductive set. And that is the sense in which we have constructed omega. Whew. Okay, um, we kind of did it. If you adopt axioms one through seven, those simple ones, plus the power set axiom, plus the, uh, the, 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 this new axiom of infinity, we can now construct the natural numbers. And what we have really done, and this is kind of like bold now, what we have really done and I sort of said this already uh, in a different class, but um, no, well, okay. Uh, the, the piano axioms are the axioms of arithmetic, but uh, the very uh, numbers themselves are can be constructed out of sets and they can be constructed out of sets in ZFC. And since every uh, number has been, def has been constructed as a set within the axioms of ZFC, all of the piano axioms 
are in fact just theorems in ZFC. So ZFC kind of like incorporates arithmetic. In other words, if you um, take the piano axioms and you set your domain of discourse to be omega, because uh, remember the piano axioms are an axiomatic theory with undefined terms. So we can interpret uh, those undefined terms however we want. We'll set your domain of discourse to be omega, this set which we have constructed in ZFC. Set your um, successor function, the undefined successor function in the piano axioms, set that to be this successor, uh, this set theoretic successor function that we have defined in ZFC, then um, the, the, piano, the piano arithmetic axioms are just true. Okay, so I don't know if we really want to do this, but uh, of course, what are the what are the piano arithmetic axioms? Uh, they are the, uh, they, there's a number zero. Well, there just is a number zero. Zero is the empty set. And we know that the empty set is an element of omega that's built into the definition of what omega is. Omega is inductive. So every inductive uh, set has the empty set in it. Hey, every number has a successor. Well, once again, uh, we have um, defined, we have constructed omega so that it is inductive. And the definition of inductive set is whenever a number is in there, so is its successor. And uh, hey, uh, another of the piano arithmetic axioms says that you never have a number, uh, you, the successor of a number can't be zero. Well, if this, suppose the successor of some number were zero. Well, if the successor of some number were zero, then that would mean that X union the set containing X was zero somehow, because that's what the successor means in this system. But zero is just the empty set, and you just get a contradiction because here's one thing that is definitely in the empty set, X, but X can't be in the empty set. And so you get a contradiction if you if you suppose that the successor of some number is, is, is zero. Okay, what else? Um, going kind of like pretty fast here, this is the one, this is another one of the piano arithmetic axioms that says that uh, the successor function is one to one. Well, this is just true. Uh, how do we show that the successor function is one to one? We suppose that two numbers have the same successor and then we try to show that they must be the same number. And this just works because if two numbers have the same successor, if the successor of X equals the successor of Y, then what this means in the language of set theory is this line right here. But then you just say like, look, man, um, X is in, these two sets are equal. So X, since X is an element of the left-hand side, X is also an element of the right-hand side. So that must mean that X either is Y or X is, contained in y and then blah, blah 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 anyway you do some math and it turns out that x equals y okay good hey also there's this thing called induction have you heard of it mm, that's another axiom of piano arithmetic well we just get that for free because if you have some set q uh okay well what, what, what's induction induction you probably think of it as saying you know if there's some property or whatever but the actually let's just keep going induction is just true all right um i kind of want to stop now but uh, what one can continue to do is create uh, more things out of sets. And so you can create, as we did in class on Piano Arithmetic Day, you can create a, uh, a function uh, based on the successor function, which uh, models addition. You can create a successor, you can create a, a multiplication function, which uh, kind of recursively defines multiplication. This is the recursive definition of um, uh, exponentiation. And now you can just verify all the rules of arithmetic. So, okay, this is like a good story. Um, this is a good story because it means that we really have constructed all of the axioms of arithmetic. We've built arithmetic back up and we've built it up using sets. We had already built it up using sets before Russell's paradox, but Russell's paradox called into question whether set theory could even be used as a foundation for mathematics. Well, ZFC has carefully and rigorously using uh, axioms with a very limited power shown that if you accept all these axioms, then uh, you in fact can reconstruct all of mathematics. Okay, there's this other axiom which is very important for fancy people called the axiom of replacement. I would like to not talk about this axiom because I don't understand it. It's very advanced. Um, unnecessary for most theorems in ordinary mathematics. I have some years spent a long period of time uh, thinking uh, deeply about this axiom, trying to understand it, but whatever I used to know, I forgot. 
Um, this is one of the things that Frankel does, which is very important. So there are certain like obscure ordinals that are needed, uh, that, that you need the, the axiom of replacement for. Um, or not obscure ordinals. Hmm. Well, anyway, no, uh, I, I think that's not true. There, the, the, the famous example of a set that, uh, requires the axiom of replacement to construct is this set. So if this is a, an important set in your life, uh, Omega, Omega plus one, Omega plus two, then, uh, no, that uh, you can't build this set with the previous axioms. But if you have the axiom of replacement, then you can. Okay, then let's not forget that this is ZFC. And ZFC uh, builds into the axiomatization the axiom of choice, which most mainstream mathematicians accept as being obviously true, necessary for mathematics, etc. And so I won't try to explain the, the axiom of choice again, but uh, the axiom of choice is the, the ninth and last axiom of ZFC. We already know about the axiom of choice, blah, 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 somewhat controversial. Oh, and notice that, uh, okay, not, not notice, but there are, suppose you don't like the axiom of choice. Well, if you don't like the axiom of choice, then Zermelo Frankel's got you also. All you got to do is leave off axiom nine. And in fact, among people who are fighting about the axiom of choice, they might adopt as their set theory, ZF. And so when people say uh, ZF, they are referring to the zermelo frankel axioms, not including the axiom of choice. And when people say ZFC, they are talking about the full uh, set of, of axioms, including uh, including axiom nine, the axiom of choice. Okay, um, are we done? This is the final slide. What have we actually accomplished? Well, the good news is that we have constructed an entire uh, foundation for all of mathematics. And this is in principle accepted as the foundation for mathematics, even today in 2024 amongst certain kinds of people. I would say average working mathematicians who don't obsess about set theory and uh, don't work on you know deep, deep, low level foundational issues. If you ask them, hey, what are the axiom of, axioms of mathematics? They will say ZFC. ZFC axiomatizes set theory and set theory is the language of mathematics in the sense that every mathematical object can be represented as a set. So in some sense, we've succeeded, except for one giant major problem. We have not proven that these axioms are consistent. And uh, in other words, um, we think that these ZFC axioms do not lead to contradiction. And Bertrand Russell, uh, uh, after stumbling upon Russell's paradox, has kind of uh, made us all aware that we should be panicked about our potentially, um, uh, that, that uh, of our uh, axiomatic systems being contradictory. And certainly no one expected set, naive set theory to be contradictory. Um, and so just going on feels that we have avoided Russell's paradox, okay, sure. Uh, maybe we've avoided Russell's paradox, but have we avoided all possible paradoxes? We can't really let ZFC be a foundation for mathematics until we have uh, showed that this foundation is free of contradictions. And so what we really need is a proof that these axioms are consistent. This sounds like it would be really, really hard to do. And in fact, Zermelo attempted in the spirit of the era to prove that his axioms were consistent and he was unsuccessful. Okay, uh, and you might be wondering, how would we even do this? How would it even be possible to show that uh, the axioms of ZFC were consistent? Well, if you think of every method that we've had at our disposal in the past to show that a certain set of axioms was consistent, that would involve creating models. But how can you create a model of ZFC? A model of ZFC uh, would have to be some set of objects which satisfy the axioms of ZFC. But we've kind of run out of objects in a sense. If everything is a set, then sets are just the most fundamental mathematical object we have. And so it's not clear, it's not, I'm not saying this is impossible, but it's certainly not going to be easy to construct a model of ZFC um, that shows that, 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 that these axioms are consistent. Okay, so I'll, I'll end on that cliffhanger. Um, goodbye. That was more like 90 minutes. Oh my God.
See you when I see you.